Welcome to New Possibilities. I speak truth to power without fear. So this video is a response to Brandon Tatum's video entitled White Privilege My Ass. I will post a link to his video in the description box so that you could watch it for yourself and judge it for yourself. But what I'm going to do is provide a summary of some of the key points that he made in this video. And then what I'm going to do is respond to those points, not point by point, but address the whole issue of white privilege and provide concrete examples of how white privilege exists in this society and its impact on black people. So let's begin by summarizing his points. The basic key point of his argument was that all white, the idea that all white people have privilege when birth is the stupidest thing that he's ever heard of. You know, he goes on to cite some example of how he was appointed to be a spokesperson for the Tucson Police Department after only being on a job for two years. And he said that he's never heard of a white person having that kind of access to becoming a spokesperson. And he basically he's suggesting that as a black person, he was in a more privileged position than many white people. And he basically used that to undermine this whole idea that white privilege exists. And then he also cited some example of how he got the best deal on his house you know, to undermine this issue of white uh, privilege in society, suggesting that, you know, he got a better deal than some white guys. So how is that possible if white privilege exists? That's basically what he suggested. Then he went on to talk about his student loan situation, how he doesn't have any student loans. He got scholarships and he said that 80 percent of the black people we know has got full scholarships to go to school, you know, suggesting that, um, Again, that white privilege doesn't really impact people's lives and that it's you know such a non-issue because of his own personal situation. And then he also cited the example of affirmative action. He said that because of affirmative action, a white person was denied a, an opportunity to get a job. Um, and he said that some other person, a black person, got the job because they're a minority. And he cited that as somehow proof that white privilege is not um, a major issue in America. And he went on to say that success in life is dependent upon you and it's not about society and this and that. And he went on to compare the idea of white privilege to the idea of racial stereotyping. And I'm going to get into that. So he provides, you know, the, a couple of examples. You know, he talks about how. Black people make up 13% of the population, but they commit like 50% or more of the violent crimes, like murder, for instance. And he's basically um, cited that to say that it would still be wrong for people to categorize black people as criminals. He basically said that black people would be in the uproar. People categorize black people that or like that or describe black people like that. And he's basically suggesting it's the same thing for black people to talk about how white people benefit from white privilege. And then he cited some examples of other forms of privilege, again, to try to downplay the significance of white privilege. He cited the example of celebrities like LeBron James having a certain level of privilege. And he cited he, himself, you know, he described himself as uh, handsome. And he said because he's quote unquote handsome, he has a certain type of privilege in society. And then he cited wealth as another example of privilege. And then he went on to talk about how they are isolated situations of white privilege and this and that. So really, white privilege is not that big of a deal in society. So what I want to do right now is just take time to... Um, respond to a couple of things. First of all, the idea of comparing racist stereotypes to the concept of white privilege is absolutely ridiculous. The idea of white privilege is not a stereotype on white people. It's about society. It's about the nature of the society in which we live. It's not a judgment on individual white people. It's about a society that is stacked in favor of white people on every single level. That's what white privilege is about. It's not stereotyping or judging every single individual white person in a negative light. Like the example of saying that black people are criminals or black people are pathological and stuff like that. It's not on that level. 
um, it's not even in the same ballpark. So I think that that comparison is very weak and fragile uh, and it's not logically sound. So that's the first thing that I wanted to get out the way. You know, the second thing is this, you know, he tries to describe this um, white privilege as some isolated situation, which is ridiculous. He describes it as, um, you know, the idea that all white people have some kind of privilege at birth is stupid. So let's go through some actual statistics. So right here, this is an article from The Root, and it provides examples of measurable white privilege. And I'm just going to go through some of those examples. Here it says that in 2012, the U.S. Department of, Just of Education, the U.S. Department of Education reported that about 33% of all white students attend a low poverty school, while only 6% attend high poverty schools. In comparison, only 10% of black students attend low poverty schools, while more than 40% of black students attend high poverty schools. And we know what this basically means that black people attend poor schools at a disproportionately high rate than white people do. And we know what comes along with that. But before I get into that, let's, let me read a little bit further. It says that this means that black students are more than six times more likely than their white students, than white students to attend a high poverty school, while white students are more than three times more likely than black students to attend a low poverty school. So that's showing you blatant examples of disparities in terms of what kind of schools black students attend versus the kind of schools that white students attend. And we all know what comes along with high poverty schools. That means schools that have less resources. You know, they have less um, train. You know, teachers that aren't as well trained. They don't have the same kind of resources like computers and technology and books and stuff like that. So we know that in low poverty, the low, high poverty schools, African Americans have less opportunity to get a high quality education. So that's one example, education. And then when we go to employment, you know, this is another manifestation of white privilege. As this points out, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, as of April 7th, and let me check to see what year this is. Yeah, this was last year, April 7th of last year. The unemployment rate for African Americans was nearly double that of whites. 8.1% for blacks and 4.3% for whites. And it's been that way for many years, you know, despite, you know, declines in unemployment, despite different administrations being in power, the unemployment rate for black people has remained consistently double the rate it is for white people. And then it, this goes on to say that black unemployment is significantly higher than white unemployment, regardless of educational attainment. And you see the the charts are here. You know, it has the, uh, you know, the different levels of education and you see the chart levels of unemployment. And then when you go to income. This goes on to say researchers at EPI found that black men with 11 to 20 years of work experience earned 23.5% less than their white counterparts. And it says black women with 11 to 20 years of experience were paid 12.6% um, less than their white women counterparts with the same experience. So those are a couple of examples. And then another example of, um, you know, white privilege is just how police interact with black communities compared to how they interact with white communities. This um, article here from um, PBS NewsHour cites some statistics about use of force. It said, looking at 19,000 
incidents between 2010 and 2015, researchers found that blacks are three and a half times more likely than whites to experience use of force. And then when you look at a report of the statistics on the use of force, here's a report from the Washington Post. You know, they have a total number of the people shot and killed by the police. So if we go take it out and just do the total. 987 people were shot and killed by the police and then when we look at race, we see that African-Americans um, were tw tw 223 people were shot and killed by police um, were African-American. That's 23 percent, even though African-Americans make up only 13 percent of the population. And then when we break it down by um, gender, we see that... Um, 214 um, people were shot that were African-American, shot and killed by the police. 22%, even though African-American men only make up 6% of the U.S. population. Now, we'll just... Now, this is the total, again, of people shot and killed by the police, 987. Now, when we go by race, we'll see that, um, you know, white people made up 46% uh, of those people who were shot and killed by police, even though white people are a much larger percentage of the U.S. population than 46%. And as I've cited before, in 2015, there was a study done, again, by the Washington Post that found that 40% of the, pe the unarmed people who were shot and killed by the police were African-American men, even though African-American men only make up 6% of the population. So those are clear and obvious examples of white privilege that exists in society. And then when we go to sentencing, we can go to this as well. You know, in terms of sentencing, it says black men who commit the same crimes as white men receive federal prison sentences that are on average nearly 20 percent longer, according to a new report on sentencing disparities from the United States Sentencing Commission. 20 percent longer sentences. And then this goes on to cite another study from the University of Michigan Law School. They found that, that all the factors being equal, black offenders were 75% more likely to face a charge carrying a mandatory minimum, minimum sentence than a white offender who committed the same crime. And then this goes on to say this. America, you know, houses the world's largest prison population. And then it goes on to say, among whites, the rate is 450 inmates per 100,000 people. The incarceration rate for blacks is five times higher, five times higher at 2,306 inmates per 100,000 people. So that's an example in, um, you know, in terms of sentencing, And then when you look at student debt, you know, since he brought up this subject of student debt, let's go through this. This article right here from um, Brookings says this. It says, um, black college graduates owe $7,400 more on average than their white peers. And then it goes on to say this, but over the next few years, the black-white debt gap more than triples to a whopping $25,000. So while he was giving you these little examples of him and his friends, you know, going to school and getting scholarships, we see that on average, black people are more in debt 
on their student loans than other groups of people and white people in particular. Again, yet another example of white privilege that exists in the society. And then we can go into other examples. We can go into the example of just how white people are viewed in the media. For instance, you have that guy um, who was the bomber in Austin, the Austin bomber, by the name of uh, Mark Condit. This man killed two people and injured at least three other people. Committing serial bombings in Austin. But how did the police chief describe him? They described him as a challenged young man who was dealing with challenges in his life. It was only after people put pressure on them that they eventually admitted that he was, in fact, a terrorist. But they described him as a challenged young man who was dealing with problems in his life. Whereas when it comes to black people, when it comes to other groups of people, um, you know, whether we're talking about Middle Eastern people, if they had committed the same thing, same type of crime, they would have been immediately called a terrorist. There wouldn't even be a, been a question or debate about it. That's how they would have described them. When it comes to black people who are victims, we receive less sympathy than white people who commit crimes, like in this case of uh, Mark Condit. He's a challenged young man, but a, a young man like a Trayvon Martin who was shot and killed by a, a racist, you know, a wannabe cop. Trayvon Martin is labeled as a thug. He's labeled as some troubled youth. He's labeled as the, the criminal. But yet the actual criminal is coddled, you know, celebrated and defended by society. And we see this time and time again, when these people kill black people, when these cops kill black people, we see that they raise a large amount of money when charges are brought against those officers for killing black people. Again, another example of white privilege. When we look at how the police deal with different situations, like that situation, um, as I cited in the debate, where you had that standoff between uh, some protesters, and I think it was in Oregon, you know, the, the Bundy compound, compound and, you know, the people that were supporting the Bundy family. They pointed assault rifles at police officers, at federal agents. And the police, you know, they waited them out. They didn't come in there with guns blazing. They didn't drop bombs on them. But when you look at how they dealt with when, how the police dealt with the Black Panther Party, when you look at how the police dealt with um, the MOVE organization in Philadelphia, when you look at how the police deal with the average black man on the street, whether we're talking about Stephen Clark in his own backyard, unarmed, the only thing he had in his hand was a cell phone. They killed that brother on sight within three seconds of arriving on the scene. When we look at Tamir Rice, the police arrived on the scene and within seconds they killed Tamir Rice. But yet when it comes to these white people who were armed, the police waited them out. The police didn't come in there with guns blazing. And that's yet another example of the white privilege that we're talking about. And now we've touched on every aspect of life just about. You know, we could even go into health care, comparing black people to white people, etc. But we've touched on every single aspect of life just about. We touched on education, we touched on income, and we could even go into wealth disparities. We touched on police violence, we touched on sentencing, we touched on media coverage. Seeing the pervasive impact of white privilege just makes it abundantly clear that this is not some isolated situation as suggested by this guy, uh, Brandon um, Tatum. You know, he's just flat out wrong. And, you know, and I know people love to hear a Negro get on here and talk about how, you know, white people are not privileged, you know, basically making it seem like white people are the victims. That's essentially what this guy tried to do. And I want to touch on affirmative action. He like kind of suggested that the, all these white people were suffering because of affirmative action, that black people were, in fact, the ones privileged because of affirmative action. 
When the fact of the matter is, you know, when it comes to admissions to universities, affirmative action only impacts a small percentage of people. It only a small percentage of African Americans get admitted to these universities under affirmative action. The majority of these elite uh, institutions, like whether we're talking about a Harvard, Yale, or any of those other Ivy League schools, they're predominantly white. It's only a few African Americans that are able to get into those universities because of affirmative action. And affirmative action is just one piece of it. You know, and when they use affirmative action, all kinds of people other than African Americans benefit from affirmative action because race is just one of many factors considered by these universities, for instance, when they have affirmative action programs. So race is just a factor of a factor. People are admitted based on their income, like if they come from a low income family or if they come from a rural uh, community or other types of characteristics like uh, gender comes into play as well. There's a host of different factors that they consider when they uh, use these affirmative action pat programs. So black people are not privileged by any stretch of imagination under you know, these affirmative action programs in universities. And then when you go to like, um, you know, he's excited. He cited examples of, I think it was like a public servant, like a police officer or a fireman. I mean, a lot of these fire departments and police departments lack diversity. They lack diversity. And often, you know, they have certain tests that are used to um, make it possible for people to get jobs at those um, different uh, agencies like the police department or the fire department. And often many of those tests are racially biased. Many of those tests are not really job related. So the idea that because somebody scored higher on the test or whatever, that made them a better qualified candidate, that's not necessarily the case. And for this guy to be whining about a couple of white people not getting a job is preposterous when you see that a lot of these Fire departments and police departments completely lack diversity. They're predominantly white. And when you have a police uh, force that doesn't reflect the larger community, then you have the problems of police brutality that we talked about. You have the problems of racial profiling that we talked about. You need to have African Americans in those police departments and fire, you know, on the fire um, force as well because these institutions should reflect society. So, you know, I just think that it is very weak and very disappointing to see a black man whine and cry about a couple of white people that didn't get a position, um, quote unquote, because of affirmative action. And, you know, I question that. I, I question the idea that somebody didn't get a position because of affirmative action. You know, I think that that's preposterous. But I, I think I've made my point. You know, the bottom line is this. White privilege definitely exists and it impacts every aspect of life. It is not an isolated situation. So tell me what y'all think. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Peace.